<laughs> All right, what's going on, guys? My name is Josh Corporal. Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live today. It's a very special one. I've got Bob Yeager on the line. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here. I appreciate your time, man. I uh, I love the fact that you're outside in the back. This is perfect. It's a perfect scene. Uh, before we get into before we get into what we're going to be talking about on the show, which is wilderness wilderness readiness, you know, bonding with your family outdoors, getting back to those traditional values. Before we get into all of that, let me just explain a little bit about what Fire Builders is. We bring on experts Monday through Saturday. Uh, we stream live at noon Eastern, and we talk about these big concepts, these big topics. We break them down into small steps, things that you can do every day to improve. And today is a good one, something that is near and dear to my heart, because this is essentially how I was raised. What we're going to be talking about today, um, it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't all laptops and stuff for me. We didn't even have that stuff when I was growing up. And I essentially spent my entire life outdoors. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Bob Yeager and his entire family, right, have been actively sharing knowledge with those who that enjoy the wilderness. They want to become more self-reliant. They want to go back to those traditional values. But for Bob, it wasn't always about that. In fact, he had an extremely successful career, 29 years, in fact, working with business greats like Billy Mays, Jim Rohn, Henry Hillman, and, uh, and basically decided to move away from that lifestyle and go back to the solid family roots of, of wilderness readiness. And that's where he finds himself right now. He is the owner and operator of the site uh, One Foot in the Wild, right? Which is essentially like a way to keep the, the traditional ways in the back of your mind at all times, you know, just one foot there while you can still return to, you know, the fast pace, the media, the, the everything that that you would recognize in the 21st century. He also has a company called Self-Reliance Media. And you know, you teach everything now. Uh, all it's all project-based. It teaches confidence, it teaches leadership, it teaches, you know, kids and adults to have respect for themselves and their environment. And that's why I'm so excited to have you, man, on the show. Again, thanks for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you. I was waiting for trumpets to sound after. <laughs> It'll be the roosters, man. They'll yeah. show up. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, so, dude, so welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time. I love that you're sitting outside. It's almost like we're kind of around a campfire right now. We were just talking before the show about how important that is. Tell me a little bit about where you are in the world and and what your typical day looks like nowadays. Oh, well, I'm not far from where you grow up, grew up, man. I mean, I'm I'm over in Middlesex, PA, right, right outside of Butler. So, where'd you grow up, Wexford or something like that? Yeah, right. North Hill is right there in Wexford. That's not that's not 25 minutes away from here. You know, going uh, east, right? And um, I came out here after uh, we shut down our family's uh, cemetery business. Or so our family had a bunch of cemeteries for years. My mom and dad were caretakers and stuff, and I I took over things as they got older. And um, my mom and dad got sick. My dad passed away. My mom moved away with my sister. And I'm sitting there like, I own this media marketing company. And here I am digging graves and mowing lawns and pruning shrubs. It's like, what is this? So um, I bought this place off of my wife's grandmother. And they built a house in the back. So my mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law live right. I could walk to their house in 30 seconds, literally. Um, but you know, my wife's grandmother's 85 years old on dialysis and my wife's mother didn't have a lot of help around here. So we're like, that house is big enough, a little three bedroom ranch house and, you know, a few acres of land. And, you know, and then when I came out here, a lot of it was my back was killing me. I, I just barely move. And then a few months ago, um, a friend of mine, he's a chiropractor, he fixed me after 10 years. And I've been out chopping wood and building chicken coops and <laughs> hiking, you know, 15, 20 miles a week and, you know, all kinds of stuff, man. You know, taking advantage of it. Did he do that thing where, I don't know if you've ever seen that on YouTube. There's like a whole pe list of, uh, of chiropractors that show you what they do, how they adjust you. And then there's a whole tribe of people that follow them and love watching it. But do they do that thing where they just like yank your head out and they stretch your whole spine out and crack everything? I couldn't even tell you what he did because at first it was so damn painful that because my whole body was twisted. So my shoulders were like this 
my hips were twisted, my knees were twisted in opposite directions, my ankle, my one ankle was lifted up, all my fingers were crooked. Now he did head to toe, man. And it was like every two days, you know, three or four sessions in a row. And uh, the best part of it, they put me in a massage chair for the first hour. of it. <laughs> and then they put these uh, heating electrolysis stuff that tighten up your muscle, you know, get your muscles all tightened up and stretched and everything as painful. Um, but now I'm like, I'm all symmetrical, <laughs> so I can, <laughs> but for a long, longest time, I could barely, you know, I'd be out in the cemetery weed whacking or whatever with my dad. And I couldn't hold on to that, that thing for more than 10 minutes at a time. I'd have to take a break for 20 minutes. And then after we were done for three days, I was sitting in my chair, barely able to move. Now you won't even catch me sitting in my chair. I'm sitting in this chair cause I'm doing this with you, but usually I'm standing up and I'm moving around and doing all kinds of stuff now. So it feels better. And I, as a result, man, I mean, I, I lost weight cause I'm more active. I lost like 25 pounds, uh, which was good. And, um, I'm getting more dense, lean muscle now, you know, and my son who's 10, he's out there with me doing all this stuff too. Nice. Yeah, it's good. And we were talking like, uh, you know, as, as far as building muscle goes like that work muscle, there's nothing in comparison. You can go to the gym all you want, but as soon as you actually work for it, man, it's that that's the densest muscle there is. Yeah. And, and if you look at most, a lot of gyms today, they're doing a lot of the stuff that we would do with the big ropes and the tires and you know, moving stuff and swinging sledgehammers and all that stuff. And there's a reason for it. Uh, that work muscle, there's no mistake in, you know, natural work muscle. And I grew up with that. Like when I was a kid, we'd be carrying, you know, five gallon buckets of concrete up and down the hills in the cemetery to pour footers and stuff. And I was like eight. Right. So your body remembers that my body was saying, Hey man, <laughs> get back out there and get the work. Yeah. You remember me? Like, come on. <laughs> Trust me, it challenged me quite a few times in this process too, man. <laughs> I'm gonna be taking, you know, groups of kids and their parents out in the woods and stuff. I better be, I better be fitter than they are, you know. And then I, I'm, I'm writing a routine, a 30 day routine before they come to one of my classes. Do these things to prepare yourself because you're carrying a uh, anywhere from 25 to 45 pound pack, 5k a day you, you got to be ready for that. That's not something you can just jump into real quick or anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. And, and, and tell me a little bit about that. Like, so the stuff that you're teaching in these classes, it's things that you learned. I mean, pretty much through your life. Tell me about how you grew up with a lot of these and learning a lot of these skills. Well, there was a few things, um, before we moved on into adult life, like we weren't, we, no, no guy was, this is my mom's rule. No man was allowed to leave the house without knowing how to cook, do your laundry, clean the house and all that stuff. My wife would argue, I don't do enough of that, but I do cook dinner every night. Right. Um, the other thing was my dad, um, he was adamant that from the time we were really little, you had to know how to grow food, how to hunt food, how to trap food, how to process food, how to preserve food. And that wasn't prepping. We, we didn't do prepping. That was just common sense. You know, so my dad being a landscaper, he's laid off for like five months out of the year. And if you didn't grow and hunt, you weren't really going to eat in the wintertime. Right. And then um, when it came down to like working with my hands, like blacksmith, and I did go to school for engineering, but I didn't learn that stuff in, in school. I learned that stuff in, in the shop when I was a kid. So my first car, I had to build my first car. You weren't allowed to just go buy a car yet. You, you had to know how to work on it, basically. So my dad brought it home, just a frame, motor, tranny, no drive shaft, no body. Next day, he brings home this body that was rusted all to hell and back. And I had I had to tear everything down myself, put everything back together. And he gave me some tips, but not much. And trust me, first three times that engine did not start. I don't know why still to this day, but it didn't start. But um, it was always, you know, what's the the old adage the path to enlightenment chop wood carry water before and after right so when i started the stuff i'm doing today i thought to myself well anything i do marketing copywriting any of that stuff i do is chop wood carry water you're doing the same things over and over and over again and a lot of it is that tedious you know grueling work that you hate but the result at the end of it is that astounding thing right? It's that exciting thing. So I just went back to that simple chop wood, carry water type of life. And the first thing I had to do was minimize all the unnecessary stuff, just get rid of it. And that's not saying like, don't go to the movies or don't go out to eat or any of those things. Yeah. Was to say, you know, 
we have an Xbox. We don't need a Wii and a PlayStation and this and this and this, right? Um, we don't need TVs in every room of the house. Just one. That's enough. I don't even watch it anyway, right? Um, the kids aren't allowed to have a TV in the room. Um, they have devices, but it's very monitored and everything. Um, we know that with the lockdown, they had to communicate with their friends in a different way, right? So we allowed a little more leeway with that stuff, but I'm still like my son every day. I'm like, all right, buddy, 20 laps in the pool. Let's go. All right. Get out there right now. It's 4 a.m. Like <laughs> first, because they became uh, kind of stagnant and complacent from the lockdown, they weren't having gym class and all these other different things. It was hard for them to get out there and, and work those muscles and everything. But after the first two weeks, now he's like, Daddy, it's time to swim. Like, let's go. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, well, but, what do you say? What do you say to people that hear that? You know, because they must say, you know, the reason that I don't do that for my kids is because I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to like you know, have them hate me, but I feel I, like it's the exact opposite. Like maybe they, maybe they hate you for the first week, but then after that, they start to see the value in it. Yeah. Our kids love us, but they don't always have to like us. Um, you know, our job as parents until they're off on their own is to cultivate their morals, their ethics, their, um, their physical abilities, their health, and most importantly, their mental fortitude to handle life as it comes at them. Like, I don't sugarcoat life with my kids at all. Um, I don't scare them. I'm not telling them everything that's in the news and all that stuff, right? Because who, I don't believe half of it anyway. Um, but I I was raised, my dad was raised on a farm. He quit school in the ninth grade to work on the farm. My mom quit school in her senior year of high school to start a family. Um, and they have they were always very blunt with us. I took a different approach uh, where, you know, my wife and I both, study child developmental psychology and you know we both went to college and we we got a little more educated but we realized that um our kids don't get to tell us no or what they're going to do we get to help them plan what they're going to do if they tell us no they have to give us a good reason why and they rarely have a good reason why besides i don't want to right I, um but it's not about being a bad guy my kids love me they'll the and my wife, they, they strive to spend every moment they can with us. All right. So when they were first born, I worked at home and I had the cemeteries to do. And my wife stayed at home with the kids until they were off to school, basically. So we spent the first, you know, five or six years of their lives collectively with them all the time. Not, not helicopter parenting. We don't do that. It's like, Hey, go have fun. Get out of here. You know, go, go do something with your friends. Right. But we were very, we explained to them the way people are and the way people get offended by certain things. And, um, it's best to have that kind of gray man type of scenario where you don't stand out in the crowd until you need to stand out in the crowd. Right. And we also, we have this rule in the house. You're not allowed to repeat what daddy says. <laughs> there, there's certain things daddy finds funny. and You're not allowed to repeat those things. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think a lot of parents, um, they're afraid that they're going to raise their kids the wrong way. And none of us know exactly the right way. And it's an experiment. It really is. All you can do is um, think about the things that your parents raised you with that you agreed with that you, you, you're kind of like, yeah, that built this strength in me. Right. And then, Try to find other people to teach you about the things your parents put down. Like my parents thought rich people were bad. They had to be, they had to do something wrong to become wealthy and stuff. I was lucky enough to have like Henry Hillman, one of the richest men in the United States, right? Um, and Billy Mays and Jim Rohn to teach me what wealth really was. And wealth has so little to do with money and so much more to do with your mindset and the way you conduct your life and the way that you enhance upon your skills and the way that you are like, I'm, I'm truly appreciative of the way people are. So if people are hateful, I can appreciate why they're hateful. Doesn't mean I agree with it. Right. So it's just a different approach to life. And if you can teach your kids that, I mean, starting young, they're like a empty bucket. Yeah. You them up till they're about 12 then forget it. You, you, you don't have the chance anymore. Right. But, during that time until they're about a teenager, you have all this opportunity to, to feed them with good stuff, but let them have a pocket knife. Let them go out and climb a tree. Let them chop wood. 
let them play with sharp, pointy things because they'll only get cut once before they learn, <laughs> right? <laughs> but when I was a kid, I don't know about you, we had a, every boy had a pocket knife in his pocket. 100%. I still have the same one my dad gave me when I was eight years old. It's an old Swiss Army knife. I carry it. I've carried it every day ever since he gave it to me. And they have, I mean, if, if this breaks, I can send it back to that company, Victorinox, and they will fix it for life. Right. So my dad knew when he handed me this and he explained to me, this is a life tool. This is something you will have for the rest of your life. And when you don't have it on you, you'll miss it. And tell me every time I didn't put it in my pocket, I missed it. Right. But I was teaching a boy scout class once and there was parents that didn't want their kids to, to learn how to use pocket knife. And I'm like, well, they joined the scouts and that's one of our primary tools. So they kind of got to learn how. Was right? it because because they were afraid they didn't trust their kids enough to, to use it and they didn't want to get them hurt, essentially? They're, they'd say things like, you don't understand my kids like this. And, you know, I'm like, if you sit, kids will respect you when you respect them. The funny thing about kids. They don't just give you respect. Just like you want to have people earn your respect kids are the same way and they don't even realize they're that way if you tell a kid they can't if you tell them that uh i don't trust you with that and all these things they will grow up in their lives thinking that parents aren't meant to trust their kids so parents are meant to tell their kids everything they can and cannot do where if my my daughter came to me one time she goes i want to try violin i said okay if i buy this violin you got to at least do it for a year. You got to stick out the school year and, you know, orchestra and, and do this thing. And I thought to myself, she's not going to like violin. I, I wasn't wrong. <laughs> My son <laughs> played drums and I used to play drums. And so I bought him a drum kit and I even built a loft bed because his room's really small to put the drum kit underneath it. And I told him he has to stick with it. When he said he wanted to join the scouts, I'm like, okay, but you have to understand that the end point of scouts is not like Eagle. It's beyond that because you have to go back and teach the younger kids those skills too. You have to contribute back. So if you join this, and he was like five or six, I said you're in it. This is yeah. This is this is a bigger this is a bigger commitment than you think. Right. I said when you're 18, you can decide I want to quit. But after that, or before that, no, you, you're in it. You're in it for good, and I want you to give it 100% your all. And trust me, there's been times we were hiking and he cried. He's afraid of heights and we were hiking near a river and we were up really high and he cried. I said, look at the roots, look at the rocks, they're steps. They're just steps. I said, you don't fall off the steps going down into the basement or go, you know, walking in the city or anything like that. He goes, no. Nah. And I'm like, they're just steps. Once he, he got that, the heights thing went away and he was walking on a sprained foot. I said, we're not doing 10 miles today, man. We're only doing two. So, you know, this is just the bruised foot. You, you'll be okay. And he's like, I can do it. Oh, and every time you come across one of those situations that scared him, I guess they're just steps. And that's those little things. That yeah, help. that stick with you. They'll always stick with you. Now, keep in mind, his fear of heights came from he was on steps at my dad's house one day, outdoor concrete steps. And he was like two and he fell face down. He went to stand up and boop, right off the step. That's where it came from. And I knew that. So it's like every chance I get, I, I, I give them the opportunity to overcome it. I don't push them to the point of being anxious and freaking out. Um, but I'm also one of those people that are like, well, he's scared. Don't, don't, don't make him do, don't, don't. No, no, I'm not that guy. I'm like, no, please stop talking because your explanation of what he's going through, he's hearing it and he's going to take that in and believe that that's truth. And internalize it. Yeah, absolutely. No, we try everything, everything. He was afraid of jumping in the deep end of the pool. He did laps. He goes, look at me. He's all cocky now, right? He, he, he goes, you don't even get in the pool. He goes, bring it. I jumped in with my clothes on. I'm like, I'll, I'll bring it. <laughs> yeah, I could still bring it. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you, where do you think then that, that most parents go wrong? What, are, what if, if there are people listening right now that, that you know, uh, totally 100% agree with what you're saying, but they weren't raised that way, and they also don't really consider themselves outdoorsy type of people? What do you... You know, what what do they do? Well, for one, I'm not any and someone to tell any parent they went wrong anywhere. Everybody's different. Kids have different personalities, and um, like my wife works with kids that have autism and ADHD and all these different things, and she works at a preschool, right? And so she sees all the different. If you want somebody that can tell you 
how how to do it properly with kids. She's probably the good one. With me, it's more of uh, it doesn't have to be the outdoors. I, for me, the outdoors is that place. It's we're meant to be there. We're meant to enjoy it. We're meant to uh, be able to understand it and use it because, well, it's all around us all the time. No matter if you're in a city or in the woods, it's around you all the time. And when nature gets mad at you, it's going to show you, right? Hurricanes and floods and all these other different things. So it's it's really more about give kids a routine that helps them work on certain skill sets or helps them work on their mindset constantly routine right and i think what happens a lot of times is um parents take a scattered approach with their kids to where they're doing this new thing then this new thing then they're going to go to this event and this event and it's the days are all different kids need although it can be boring at times kids need a certain routine even if it's just for the first three or four hours of the day they need that routine um but they also need to be taught things that aren't taught in the public school system so I always say the schools are in charge of teaching my kid arithmetic, arithmetic. I'm in charge of teaching them everything else. So when they come home from school, they get tired of me sometimes. Trust me, daddy, do you have to teach me another lesson right now? I thought we were just going on a walk. And I'm like, opportunity presents itself. I'm going to teach you. Right. So I think that's that's the part. People are, might be confused about, say, their kid's math homework. OK, well, grown up, go learn their math. Revisit it yourself. Because we chose to have kids, it's up to us to learn the things that we need to learn to help our kids achieve the things they need to achieve. As soon as my kids came along, look, dude, I was in rock bands. I played for the Pittsburgh Symphony. I was a sculptor, welder, worked in machine shops, had businesses, right? Fast-paced adventure, taekwondo tournaments around the world, like all the time, fast-paced. My kids were born. I'm like, my job, besides my business and besides being a husband, my primary job is to make sure they grow up good. They grow up happy and healthy. They grow up knowing how to learn because schools don't teach you how to learn. They teach you how to memorize. And knowing how to read people and communicate with people because that's extremely important in everything that you do. And learning how to just be true to themselves while being good to other people. And so my philosophy has always been you do you and I'll do me. And as long as you're not hurting yourself or anybody else, and I'm not hurting myself or anybody else, and we're not breaking any laws, it's all good. Just do you. Well, I'm glad that you, um, well, one, I totally agree. Two, I'm glad that you mentioned the fact that, that learning how you learn, mm -hmm. right? Like how to learn, but how you personally learn the best is such an understated necessity today. Like it's something that everybody if they haven't figured it out already should do immediately because because it's you know there's just so many different ways to approach the problem but if you don't figure out what works for you man you're going to get left behind or you're going to think that it's that it's a problem with you or yeah. the teacher or or the situation and not the fact that you just need you know you just need to figure out that hey the rocks are just steps like like that's that's, that's it you know that everything's just steps. That's all it is, more steps. And um, it was like I, I talked to my wife years ago about this. Schools will sometimes put a stigma on children. I'm not putting down teachers or schools. I, I, love, I love that there's schools for everybody, that you can go and get an education. What I don't like is you're not a good reader. That carries with them. So then when they're adults, they're like, well, I don't, I don't read books. I listen to audio books. Well, that's not going to help you become a better reader. Most people read at a fourth to sixth grade reading level. That's adults. I know adults with PhDs that only read at that level, right? And that's not good, right? How can we possibly teach our children to be better at that core skill of reading and understanding and comprehending and retaining if we're not willing to practice it ourselves, right? So my thing has been for the past 20 years, read a book a week and understand it and retain it. And if I don't understand and retain it, I'm reading that book again next week until I get it, right? But it's also... Um, Throughout life, it's like, ah, well, here's here's a common parent phrase. I've heard it before. Uh, you know what? That algebra, I know I wasn't very good at it either, and I never had to use it. I went to engineering school, folks. I had to use it. I'm in the wilderness. I use it all the time when I'm building and constructing things, right? Yep. You don't realize that you actually are using it, and if you better understand it, take the time to better understand it.
you'll see all these different elements in life that help you figure out problems because this variable is missing, but you don't know what that variable is. Well, how do you find it? Algebra, right? Using that thought process of algebra, the mechanics of it, you can apply that to any element of your life. Remove the numbers and letters and put in person A, person B, situation A, situation B, accomplishment or big goal that I want to achieve. What's missing in between? I don't know. I'm going to put together a formula to find the things that I don't know. I don't know. Right. That's what algebra is. So take away the math part of it. People hate math or whatever. Take away that part of it and think to yourself, it's just a process of being able to figure things out. Yeah. You, you can do that more effectively. You can do whatever you want. I was out blacksmithing the other night. I hadn't done it in years, so I sucked at it. Right. And I'm sitting there just pounding on this piece of metal, flattening it out. And then I was carving a spoon out of a piece of green wood. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, if you can shape and form metal and you can shape and form wood, you can make anything you want. I said, now imagine I can make any products I want, or I can at least make the prototypes. Prototypes are expensive. Send that off to a company to manufacture them to me. But I at least have the prototypes. And guess what? It took me like an hour or two to make, not $20,000 to have made, right? Jeez, I never even thought of that. I'm like, yeah, just like when I have my bags made for, you know, my canvas gear that I use in my work. Um, I didn't, I don't know anything about sewing and making stuff, but I called a guy from West Virginia that's really good at it. His name's Jay Hercules. And every piece of gear he makes is different because everybody wants something different. And I'm like, hey, bro, uh, what can I do to get one of those bags designed to my specifications? And he said, well, uh, let's prototype it and I'll put it on my website. And I'm like, all right, you can put it on your website, like my gear and stuff, but I don't want any commission from, it. I just want you to make my gear for me. Right. And then I'd send him something. He wanted to take down bow saw. I sent it to him. Right. We talked about certain things in marketing and what he can do to make it better and everything. I didn't charge him anything for that stuff. Right. Yeah. That's barter. That's, that's a common human trait that we've had for centuries, barter and trade. Well, if I didn't know how to communicate, I didn't know how to find that variable that was missing and I didn't know how to seek out, be resourceful enough, forget the resources, resourceful enough to seek out the people that have the resources. I would have never accomplished those things. Right. So it's not all about like, I, yeah, I spent a lot of times in the woods, hunting, camping, all this stuff, but there's a reason for all of it. It makes me better every single day. And that's the number one goal. Make you better every single day, whether it's for, if you need to say it's for your kids, fine. If you need to say it's for that romantic relationship, well, I want, I, you know, I'm not complete without him. Well, then you got a problem because you should be complete before you're in that relationship. And that takes working on yourself every day to make you better until it just becomes routine. Once again, that every day you do something to make you better, make you more valuable. Right. Well, so. I love this. Like, uh, I've got, I've got a couple of questions too, but I'm, I'm I think I'm going to pause that for a second because I want to ask you in the quest to make yourself better every day, to take those steps, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for your kids, whether it's for the relationship between you and your kids, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'm not, I'm actually, I don't want to put words in your mouth because I kind of want to see what you have to say. I think that you touched on it a little bit, but if you, how do people start? If, if, they're just going to focus on one thing to start out as far as how to, you know, how to improve themselves, how to gain that confidence, whether it's inside or outside. In your experience, where do you think they should start? Well, think about it this way. So if I have this really big goal I want to achieve or the skill set I want to develop and everything, and it seems just so, so out in left field, like how could I ever possibly do that? It would take forever, right? So I'm already putting those doubts in my head. Like, ah, it take too long. It's too much work. You know, I never be able to, do... I start by saying, well, you know what I'm going to do first is I got to practice being more valuable again, increasing skill sets again. So I'm going to choose something simple at first, right? It's just like people that want to lose weight. Well, the first path to that is remove sugars, bad sugars, right? Well, okay. So I'm, I'm not going to stop at the, I'm going to take a different route to work. So I'm not going past that filling station where I usually buy the bottle of Pepsi in the Snickers bar, right? It could be as simple as that. I'm not planning a diet. I'm not going to plan to go to the gym every day. No, because those plans never happen because your mind starts saying that's too much work. I don't have time for that. Right. But I can say, I'm going to go a different route to work today. 
so I don't go past that place that always draws me in, right? So for me, like say the blacksmithing thing, I used to do it all the time for sculpting and stuff, but I never did it heavily for utilitarian type tools, making things that, that were useful, basically, right? I made things that were pretty. So I said, well, I need an anvil. And my head goes, I want a big 400 pound German anvil. And they're like five, six grand, right? And I'm like, or I'll use a Chinese knockoff that's 30 bucks just to get started, right? All so right. for me, the barrier to entry was, do I really want to invest in that giant thing that I can't move by myself, that I don't know where I'm going to put it? And it's four or $5,000, to justify, I'm going to hammer on it a few times and maybe not enjoy this, right? So I said, nah, I'd be willing to sacrifice 30 bucks, though, and just, you know, use the tools I have already and start hammering on hot metal a little bit, right? See see if I enjoy it. See if it's, see if my body's ready for it because, you know, the joints and the back and all that stuff. Yeah, impact, like the impact of doing all that stuff for right. sure. For me, um, every day you should be increasing, for one, your self-confidence, Find something to achieve every single day. It can be small. If you're start, I used to tell internet business owners, set up an autoresponder, buy a domain and connect it to a hosting account. Put on a simple WordPress blog and write your first post, right? But only start with the domain name. Then the next day, get a hosting account and figure out how to connect the two. Then the next, they're like, but I don't know how to do all that. I'm like, don't worry about it. As you're doing it, You'll say, I need to learn how to do this. So you'll search YouTube or Google or something like that, and you'll figure out how to do it. Somebody will show you how to do it, right? This is the first time in human history we have access to every bit of information that ever existed. So if you can't find how to do it, you ain't looking because it's out there, right? Now, there's a lot of people that are going to try to take your money for stupid stuff like that. But like I said, quick YouTube search. Some guy from India is like, here's how you register a domain name. Here's how you connect it to a hosting account. Here's how you install WordPress using Fantastico or whatever, right? And here's the different hosting accounts that we suggest that you use. Maybe you choose Bluehost or something where I chose a dedicated server because I had a big marketing agency, right? So I didn't know how to do any of that stuff back in like 2006. This is every day I did one thing every single day. And then I'm like, okay, pick up your game a little bit, Bob. You got this. You're you're fine. What's the quickest, most effective way to get there? Oh, barter with somebody that's better at it than me. That's what I did next, right? So for me, it's like you do little things every day to make an accomplishment. It makes you feel good, right? And then you start doing little things every day that help you accomplish things that you're actually setting out to achieve, right? So maybe it's like, oh, I'd like to, I, I want to read like all of these books that I've bought over the years that I've only read the first page of, right? Okay. Start with a half a chapter today. Tomorrow, see if you can do a chapter. Next day, well, set aside some time and see if you can just read until you're done reading and keep doing that every single day. Make it a point. If you can make it a point to watch Breaking Bad and all whatever other, <laughs> yeah. watch Netflix during a freaking pandemic. Why, why weren't you reading those books? Why weren't you taking notes? Why weren't you dog ear? Those books should look abused at the end of three or four months of lockdowns and all this other crap, right? What people don't realize, what happened over this spring is coming again. There's going to be this time that you don't know what to do with, right? What did I choose to do with that time? Spend more time with my children, with my wife, and enhance this business, this outdoors business, by teaching other people, by recording videos, by posting things. I didn't know if they were good. I didn't care if they were good. I was just putting them out there, right? But most importantly, I said, okay, guess what I'm doing? I'm deciding not to do copywriting as a business anymore. I shut down my LinkedIn account. I shut down my Twitter account. I didn't just shut them down. I deleted them. Because if you deactivate and, oh, well, I can come back later. Well, guess the temptation. What? The temptation is always going to be there. Yep. I say try to get rid of, be prepared for almost anything in your life, but get rid of some safety nets, the ones that cause you to go back to old habits, right? And when you do that, you'll find that it's scary. You're kind of like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did that, like for the next week or whatever. But you'll get over it, right? You, can, you lived without it before. There was a time you lived without that stuff, right? But for me, what it was is I was looking at notifications and updates, 
friends of mine posting articles and professionals in the industry posting articles and videos and stuff. And as I'm watching this stuff, I realized they all kept bleeding into the same conversation. And that was, they don't agree with this politically. They don't agree with that politically. They think people should do this. Well, I got news for you. It's not for another grown adult to tell me what I can and cannot do, for one. Number two, I think about my community, the safety of my community. Do I think it's healthy to wear a mask all the time? No, I do not. I know scientifically it's not healthy to wear a mask all the time. But if a private business owner says they require me to have something on my face before I can enter their store, well, that's their business. It's not mine. So... It, I know it's not effective, but if it gives everybody around me peace of mind, okay, it's on, I'm in there doing my thing, and then I'm out, right? And guess what happens when I'm out? But if I'm outside, you tell me I got to put something on my face, I'd say, how about we do this? Stay away from me. Just back up and stay away from me. Give me, I'm a germaphobe anyway. Give me my space, okay? So right. if you're closer than my arm's length, you're too close to me. Back up, Right. But I'm not going to sit outside in the 95 degree heat or while I'm hiking and stuff doing this. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to force my kids to do that. But back to the question, if I could only suggest one thing, every single day, try to create an achievement that makes you feel good, right? Start small. Doesn't even have to be towards that big goal you're looking to achieve. Get into the routine of achieving something every single day. Right. It could be you got a pile of dishes every single day in your sink and you wait a week until you wash the damn things. Well, how about this? Wash them today and do that every single day until you never have that problem ever again. Yeah. And the bigger goals. Right. Well, I tell you, not only do I feel like in doing that, it improves your situation like as a human. Right. right. But also in the general context of of leading by example, of having your children see that. Right. And emulating you because they they see how much joy that brings. They see what you know, what kind of you're getting stuff done, but you're not freaking out, and stressing out about it. I mean, that that to me is like the best type of leadership example. And it goes along with uh, I mean, because I came up on like a tall ship world. So a lot of the stuff that you're talking about being outdoors, like uh, the, uh, the the we would do the exact same stuff on a ship, you know, the routine. Yeah. Like a fine knot, the bowling knot. You're yeah, screwed. you're on a boat, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're totally screwed, man. And like, and we they used to have us tie those with our eyes closed behind our back. You know, we had to do that all the time, and we had to do it fast. Piece of rope and wrap it around you, and with one hand tie that same exact knot around you, and that's a recovery loop. If you get fall down and somebody needs to recover you, that's that's not yeah. A or not that's how they're going to recover you right yeah yeah these don't work can you do it with your left hand can you do it with your right and that, and that's the other thing like in your day-to-day -day things that you do can you do it a different way right can you do it more effective more efficient a higher quality way can you do it faster can, do you need to recruit help with it right and it, it's those basic skills like tying the knots and things like that it's not okay to have an undressed knot when you're in the wilderness even if you're just practicing, dress it up, make it look really good, right? Learn how to tie something that can be easily untied, right? Those skill sets, like my son's in the Boy Scouts, right? He just crossed over to Boy Scouts from Arrow of Light and the Cub Scouts. And when he was doing his Arrow of Light training, I realized that it was a lot more difficult than previous Cub Scout stuff was. So I'm like, okay, I'm telling him he's got to achieve these merit badges and do all this stuff for his era of light. And then when he gets up in the Boy Scouts, he's got to do all these things for these different ranks. How can I sit here and tell him he needs to do all that stuff when he's not seeing me do any of that stuff? Yeah, exactly. So I took all the tests that you could possibly take, and I got the shirt, and I got the badges, and I got the Cub Master pat, and I got an award at a ceremony for Cub Master. I started teaching pocket knife training and I started teaching cast iron cooking to the scouts. I started doing all this stuff with his group, with his den. And he just started seeing my shirt fill up with trained and youth protection and all this other stuff that's on it. Right now I got the full uniform. He sees daddy show up like that. That uniform looks like the boy scout uniform. So it's different than the cup scout uniform and his he started looking at other Boy Scouts. He's like, I want that rope on my belt. I want that thing around the shoulder. Like, how did they get that patch there, right? How did they become the den master and all that stuff, den chief and all that stuff? It took me 
to kind of like show well, I'm willing to do it. I can do it. If I can do it, you're smarter than me, man. You can do it. Right? Yeah. Dude. He, what would it take you to get your Cub Master training? I'm like, four hours of testing. That was it. Right? I said, but that's not over. I got to work with kids to enhance upon those skills. So once yeah. you learn and you're doing it, teach it to make you better and to pass those skills along to other people. So if I told him early on, remember, I said, once you hit Eagle or whatever, you got to still teach other kids. Right? I think I said that before we started recording, right? Yeah. You're not done with it at Eagle. He's going to hit Eagle when he's like 15 or 16. You're still going to be in there until you're at least 18 years old teaching these other kids the things you learn. Well, how can I expect him to do that if I don't show him me doing that? Show him an example, a good example of that happening, right? So now he's very rule oriented and he's kind of like, I don't like when people are sc screwing around during ceremonies and stuff. And he keeps his uniform neat and tucked and everything. And when it's time for a class B, that means like shorts and a t shirt. Oh, yeah, the uniform's off and he's out there like that. <laughs> because that's the time it's okay. When it's time for a class A, he has his hat, his belt, his kerchief, his slider, everything's tucked, everything's twisted right everything's where it's supposed to be and he will never do any scouting activities without that pocket knife in his pocket because that's yeah. right well i love i love that whole premise right because if you would have forced that upon him at right. the very beginning and been extremely strict about it but not really told him why nor nor provide any kind of living example of how it should be there's no way i mean honestly there's, i shouldn't say there's no way but the the probability that he would have taken it to that degree on his own right. is is and one thing that i don't know if you ever heard of the guy uh, a naveen jain entrepreneur yeah. over in in california really really smart guy and i uh, i listened to a podcast of his once and it's something that he said that always stuck with me was that they asked him how he teaches his kids how to be curious like how to you know how to pass on a lot of this knowledge and he said it's not you know, necessarily leading a horse to water and trying to force your kids to drink almost. It's a question of figuring out the interesting ways to make them thirsty in the first place. And that's what I feel like you're doing when you get your Cub Scout, like you go through the testing and you start having those patches, like that's what you're doing. Well, it was like, uh, I think it was last year, my son said, like he, he didn't really enjoy fishing derbies in the Cub Scouts because you got a little pond and you do some fishing and we always ended up showing up and everybody was leaving and stuff. I'm like, I said to the the uh, Earl Pack leader, a friend of mine, his name's Aaron. I said, uh, let's make it big. Like, let's do something big. I said, we got a lake right up the road that the community paid half to to redo, like over four million dollars. The community paid to redo, and I'm like, we got this really cool trout lake, right? I'll call up the uh, the Lake Conservancy and I'll call up the uh, Fish and Boat Commission. Well, what I found out, we had this plan, and the Lake Conservancy is like, yeah, great, you guys can have your big derby out there, right? We're like, awesome, this is going to be great. We find out three days before the derby that we were supposed to apply for a permit with the Fish and Boat Commission 60 days before. They didn't have to pay for it. That's just their way of seeing what's going on at the, you know, what do they need to do to make sure the facilities are good and everything. So I call up the Fish and Boat guy. There's only one in this area of Pennsylvania from Erie to freaking Waynesburg. There's only Covers one. it all. Right. And he goes, look, he goes, I don't know what I can do. He goes, give us your information. And tell your tell your pack leader to send me this stuff immediately, and I'll talk to my my commander up in Harrisburg and see what we can do. In 24 hours, our pack leader had that permit in his hand. And they're like, in the future, do it right. But well, we got it to you, right? 89 kids, over 150 people, families, and their children fishing. Some of most most of them for the first time ever, right? made some food the conservancy was out there people donated to the conservancy right and people said it's not po i don't think it's possible i don't think it's possible nobody's going to want to do this L look but you can't say hey do you guys want to do this you just got to go do it you got to show them that exactly how much what it took to get there right and on smaller scales with our kid now my son saw that and he goes wow could he didn't expect it to be that big right and he's just like what it didn't take you very long. I'm like, yeah, it's like two months of work, dude. Like phone calls mostly. I didn't, and tell everybody, meet us here and wear your little scout shirt and, you know, that kind of thing. And we'll bring hot dogs and these people will bring side dishes and we had a little buffet and everything, right? And I, I don't like buffets. I ugh, People touching stuff. I can't do it, right? But I could eat the hot dogs. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but I was just kind of like, 
I don't know of anything in this world that's not possible. I don't know of anything in this world that's not possible. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. If you think it's possible. Look, dude, we're carrying supercomputers in our pockets. Yeah, it's possible. And, and that's what I don't. And just like to your point about the fact that we have access to just about every piece of knowledge that exists. And so in a quest for that, in a quest to, um, you know, to not only improve yourself, improving your relationships with your kids, trying to make them thirsty, what you said about finding something every day, one thing to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. And starting to do it in ways that, that make you joyous, like in some one way to say it, but then, but then actually start to break down steps to achieve something. Mm -hmm. In your experience, if people just did this consistently, even if it was for the first time, if they tried it out for, for 30 days, paint a picture of where you think they'd end up, like not just physically, like here's what you, you know, have created for yourself, but also like how would they feel like, you know, mentally from a mental state? Oh, I'll I, I give you a real world kind of scenario. So last year, for whatever reason, I was completely depressed. Couldn't figure it out for the life. Of, I mean, when I'm talking depressed, I, I would not, I'd stay up till five o'clock in the morning, sleep all day, just so I didn't have to be around when people were awake. Like that, it was that bad. Right. And it was going on for months and I'm a, I'm a pretty energetic, happy guy. Right. And I couldn't figure it out. And then one day I'm sitting there and I'm like, I know what it is. I'm doing work for clients that, I don't think I should be doing that work for them. I'm giving them this power, this tool that they can use to sell things to other people. And I know that what they're selling to other people is not what they say it is. I just know it. And that's when I realized maybe my copywriting career, except for my own stuff. Sorry about the birds, buddy. <laughs> There's a nest like right here. Um, the It got to the point where I realized that there's a lot of unscrupulous people in the industry that I was working in and it was ve getting very difficult to differentiate which ones were which. And I didn't want them to get, give them a tool or a power that they could use to manipulate other people. When copywriting does that, it at least inspires people to manipulate themselves into doing something, buying something. Right. And then I realized people were just taking and taking and taking and taking. I said, what can I do to make sure that I, I live by my own philosophies? I do the things that I've always strived to do. And that's make me more valuable in order to create more value for other people. Because money comes as a byproduct of that. That's all money is. It's just a byproduct, right? Of being more valuable and exchanging that value with other people, right? Help yeah. Them. So like in a day, I told my wife, I'm like, I'm not writing client work anymore. I'm not writing marketing strategies for them anymore. I'm not doing any of that stuff anymore. She goes, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going full boat into self-reliance media on one foot in the wild. I'm going to write my books. I'm going to teach my kids. I'm going to teach other people's kids if they want me to. But the role is going to be if I teach their kids, the parents got to be there too, at least one of them, because those kids are going to teach their parents skills. I want to focus on that. I was watching since... Well, since the uh, first Occupy Wall Street thing, what was that, back in 2008, 2009, somewhere around there, maybe 2010? Around there, yeah. I saw this group, this mass group of people finally starting a revolution for their own generation. And that's what Thomas Jefferson said. Everybody, every generation has to have its own revolution, right? But none of them had a clear thought of, it wasn't a collective thought of why they were there. Everybody had a different reason for being there. And none of them were telling you a really good reason. They couldn't explain it or anything. And then I, I watched these other things happen in protests and riots and all these different things. But nobody, you, you could pull any member out of a crowd. They didn't really know why they were there. They're just kind of following the herd. And I'm like, I can see what's wrong with society today. And it has nothing to do with the virus. It has nothing to do with the economy. It has nothing to do with this, this group's upset about this group or this group, you know, whatever. Take that, everything people are passionate about. Okay, hold on to that passion, but do something about it. What the problem is, is people don't clearly know why they're doing the things they're doing. They're just following that herd that they can relate to. And the internet allows us to find groups that are just like us, no matter where we're at in our heads. And that can be a little bit dangerous, right? So I say to myself, if you want to be a better parent, join a group of people that are just aspiring to be better parents, right? Take the politics away from it. You see, if you're in that group and one person discusses politics, like I'm out, I'm gone. Nope, don't want anything to do with it. But something I chose to do when that was going on, I said, I need to take more uh, a, an approach. And I'd always been into stoicism since I was in like middle school. I need to take an approach that every single day 
I'm thinking about my own principles and my, my own take me out of the situation and think about what do these people over here need me to provide? My customers, my clients, my market, right? So I started re reading Marcus Aurelius Meditations again for the 180th time. But I chose to read one thing per day and then journal about what does that mean to me and then go out and try to apply that somehow on my day, right? I'm not part of this, this equation. I'm a bystander. I'm an observer. That's it. And really get out there, really pay attention and ask questions in a way where people are giving me their feedback and everything. And that was the critical point. I realized that if you ask people for feedback, their own beliefs, their own opinions, and not hold anything against them every single day, you'll find a solution. You will. But in that time, every single day, you have to do something to enhance your value. One thing. It could be get healthier. It could be spend more time with your kids. Because trust me, you spend more time with your kids, you're going to become more valuable, right? Not just to your kids, but to other people, right? And ultimately, work on enhancing one skill. Spend 30 days being the best you can be at one skill that you know you need to achieve to accomplish the things you want to achieve. So for me, it's really being able to move through the woods and spend days and days and days out there, right? Be physically fit enough. But how can I possibly do that if I'm taking my son and he's not there too? So every single day we'd walk. Every single day we'd go out and build a small fire and cook some ramen noodles over a little tiny campfire and stuff. Every single day we'd make something out of wood. Every single day we'd sweat and drink a lot of water. And i show him how to filter water and how to boil water. Every single day I was teaching him these skills to have fun. It's not He didn't have to. It's like, all right, dude, let's go out in the woods. We'll make some lunch. He goes, oh, awesome. And I'm like, you're starting the fire today. He's like, what? Right? He's at Boy Scout camps. One of the one of his patrol leaders said, Bobby Yeager, you're cooking tonight. He goes, I don't know how to freaking cook. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> aren't you, Hunter? And he goes, yeah, I'll, I'll show him how. And so he started getting comfortable doing these things that daddy usually does for him. And while this is all happening, I'm getting more fit. I'm losing weight. I'm wanting to eat better. I'm wanting to get out there and sweat a little bit more. Right? So... The way I chose to make me better was to teach him to be better. And in that process, I had to do the same things he was doing, right? So by osmosis, I was going to be better as a result of it, right? Yeah. So a lot of times, I think the problem is when they're trying to achieve something, they're so focused on themselves. And all they have to realize is share this with somebody else. Do it with them. Learn together. Start a Facebook group and do, hey, I don't know how to do this shit. And I know none of you do. So if you want to join me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to share my progress. I want you guys to share your progress. We're all going to do it together. We're not going to sell anything. None of that crap. We're just going to do it together and see what happens, right? And by doing that, making that commitment to other people, more people would actually achieve the things they want to achieve. When you just promise it to yourself, you can forget about it. Nobody's going to know. You promise it to 10 or more people. Well, you look like an idiot if you don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Man, I'll tell you this. Honestly, dude, this has been such an amazing conversation uh, with you. And and oh, drill fire. Right. Or use a knife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's like it's 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 been like it's been a perfect blend of of taking those outdoor skills uh, and 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 realizing that a lot of it is just, it's tactical stuff. It's stuff that you, anybody can learn. I mean, it's, it's more about how you approach the prop and, and what kind of mindset you have. And that's, that's what I know that you're doing with both parents and kids. Tell me a little bit about what you got going on. How do people connect with you if they want to like participate, if they want to ask you some more questions? They can message me on Book. They can join our One Foot in the Wild Facebook group. They can comment on YouTube, right? If you go to onefootinthewild.com, you can find all that stuff, right? Um, but mostly, um, like next this weekend, I'm taking a friend and his two boys and my son out. They're all scouts, right? And we're doing a kind of like, he's going to video shoot for me. He's an Army Reserve guy. He's going to do the video for me. But we're going to work to show these boys, you know, how to collect resources, how to filter water, how to do basic first aid, how to do water rescue, these types of things. We're going to do that in a day, and that's supposed to be a three-day class, right? We're going to do everything we can in a day because it's a precursor to a class I'm teaching to, like, 12 people in September, um, boys and their dads. And... Those boys are going to, they're going to love it. They're going to set up a tent. 
but they don't get to sleep in it. They're going to sleep under a tarp and they're going to sleep under a primitive shelter. They're, they're setting up the tent for dad. Dad doesn't have to sleep in those things. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, we've suffered enough. <laughs> <laughs> they even say, well, where are you going to sleep? I'm like, in my house. I don't have to sleep out there. I'm teaching the class. I'm going to get a good night's rest. Right? Yeah, right. But what I'm doing is I'm developing programs for uh, kids and their dads first. And people had a problem with that. Like, Moms, it's coming. Just not yet. This is something it's not. This is something one of those things I need to do for me to know that I've done this thing and I created that thing. Because what people don't realize is boys and their dads communicate differently with one another than boys and their moms or girls and their moms or girls and their dads. Right. So there's a reason why we have father daughter dances. There's a reason why we had the Boy Scouts, even though it's not so much Boy Scouts anymore. It's called Scouting BSA. BSA stands for Boy Scouts of America. Go figure. Right. We have these organizations for children because boys and girls react differently to different things and with different role models that are with them and stuff. Boys will challenge their fathers, but boys will expect their mothers to kiss their knee when they fall down. Right. Well, first, I'm going to focus on no knee kissing. <laughs> You're going to fall down. It's going to happen. You brush yourself off. You get back up. And if it's bad, you take care of the problem and learn how to do that for yourself. Be more self-reliant. Right. And that's what this is all about. Self-reliance. It's not about wilderness survival. I don't teach wilderness survival. I told you before the call, you're stuck out in the snow for a couple of days or a rainstorm and you couldn't make it back to your car or your battery went dead on your car. Look, homeless people are in survival mode. You're inconveniently camping, right? That's all it is. You're, you're keeping yourself, your core body temperature in check, hydrated until somebody can affect your extraction or you can get out of there yourself. That's not survival. It's inconvenient camping. And if you're prepared for that, actually, it's enjoyable. You're like, well, screw it. I could stay out here for a little longer, actually, if I wanted to. And in the scouts, like a lot of kids I'm teaching are scouts, they have a buddy system anyway. There's no reason why any one boy should be stuck out there by themselves. For one, they should always be with another person. That's their rules. And number two, they're usually with a patrol or a troop, so they're probably not going to be alone anyway. There's probably going to be about 12 to 30 people with them. Right. So if they get stuck out there, well, they can band the resources together and they'll be just fine for the everyday hiker that takes the Appalachian Trail. It's really about um, learning to plan better, learning to be more prepared and using those skill sets or the methodology of creating those skill sets and apply that to the rest of your life. Right. Like the pandemic thing. People are like, I don't know what I'm going to do. The grocery stores are out of meat. I'm like, you know, some of mine, I got a couple of freezers full. Why do you got so much? Are you a prepper? Nope. Nope. Just in case. And it makes us not have to go to the grocery store all the time. Right. It's just common sense. I know in the wintertime, our power usually goes out where we live and it can go out for six days at a time. We have backup water supply. We have a backup generator. We have four different methods of cooking at the ready all the time. Right. We have extra gas stored for the cars or anything, because if the power is out in this area, the gas stations are shut down, too. Right. And we got to be able to get around. So those are just common sense things. But through these these things, like if I'm teaching a corporate company, like a management team, take them out in the wilderness at a state park or something like that for three days. They're going to learn that it's not about having this knife or this axe or being able to carve a stick or start a fire. All of those things are all about the mindset you take into every situation in your life or your business and how to make those things better and more effective. And that's what it's really about. So I'm just taking my past business stuff and applying it to the stuff I love with the wilderness. So I get to have fun camping and hiking. It's knowledge I have in business and life to, to teach that stuff. I love it, man. That, and it, like, I can, I so I'm, I'm envious and I can relate to a lot of that stuff. I mean, I just think that you, you're oh, doing, I'm up here. I'm I know up, I'm back home, Josh. <laughs> it calls to me. Oh my God. Uh, well, dude, I just want to say th thanks again. This has been such a cool conversation. I know that there have been, you know, guys like Dave and Perrion and um, my mom, actually, she asked, she put a couple comments in. I haven't been able to even get to those because we've just been talking this whole time. And, uh, and man, I, so, so you'll see those in the comments, Bob, uh, for this video, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're all, they're all watching it. 
Well, I, I would, but I also have to go too. We gotta, <laughs> I, uh, I, but things like here, so I'll give you an example real quick, you know, um, you know, things like the best way to teach a kid the difference between reputation versus character or, uh, or for instance, um, let's see, what's another one. The, I'll tell uh, you what, here's what I'm going to do after this call. I'm going to look at all these questions and I'm going to write a blog post on one foot in the answering every single one of those questions. It might take me, but I'll, I'll write it in the most complete way I possibly can. How about that? That's awesome, man. That's, uh, I know that, I know that that's incredibly generous. And on top of that, like, uh, yeah, dude, this, that's, that's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, dude. Uh, well, I, I have to say, um, thanks again for taking the time. I, I honestly, I think this is such a good conversation to have, especially now. And I tell you, I will let you know the next time that I am up in Wexford cause, uh, I'll come visit. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I, I thank you for not uh, sitting here asking me how to get more traffic and make more money in my business. <laughs> that. I said, I've talked about that for 20 some odd years now. I can only say it so many different ways. <laughs> Create more value, make you more valuable. Create value for people that need that value and find out an agreed upon exchange rate and then put it in front of them. There it is. That's how you make more money. That's Done. It. Yeah. And there's a million and one to do that. Pick one, pick one and make you the best at that one. Just do that until you get it right. Do it until you can't get it wrong. That's it. Seriously. For those that are listening right now, either live with us on video or on the podcast later on, like listen to what Bob is talking about this. I, I 100% agree. Just pick one thing, just one thing and go with it. And what you will learn from the experiences with that one thing will answer all of the questions that you probably have in your mind about what to do, why to do it, how to do it. Like the work teaches you the work. It's like my favorite quote of all time, Bernard Matossier. Uh, people are saying, people are saying, Bob, don't go. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, I know that, uh, I'm going to go cook my lunch. <laughs> Well, thanks again. Honestly, this has been such a cool conversation. Um, I really appreciate it. And to everybody listening, thank you for tuning in for this. This is Bob and I signing off another episode of Fire Builders Live. Bob, thanks again, man. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. All right. See you guys later. Adios. We'll catch you in another episode. Bob and Josh, out of here. See ya. <laughs>